still, a hot stool is like really, really you. hurting here. Um, how long do we have to live? Like, they're waiting on, you know, people that's going to come in and everybody's trying to do the right thing for all the right reasons. Uh, another, I don't think I can, will we able to live another 15 years waiting on this? Or will we, like, the, the, this is going to be shortened, you know? Um, people still having children. Children, babies are coming up with still more diseases, and we talk, now we talk about that's not the refinery. We talk about everything is right there, right now. You know, do we just take everybody and move away, find some type of place where we can go and and get the help that's just for that neighborhood or the people that's closest to them? Or, do, like I said, do, how long do we have to live? Like I'm, I'm still going through depression right now because of this. Carol. Uh so, I mean, this, like, Carol's story, I think th there are hundreds and hundreds of Carols and thousands of them across the city, right? People whose health is being impacted, whose family's health is being impacted. And I think one of, one of the things that always touches me when I listen to Carol speak is, like, is that kind of confusion and uncertainty, that it's not just the physical effect of dealing with asthma or watching your children deal with asthma. It's also, like, it's the kind of mental strain of, like, what is going on and, like, what, who is responsible and why is this happening and is it actually accelerating, right? There's this perception that like, didn't used to be this way but now it is and maybe even more so. So, um, yeah, I'm really grateful for that, for that perspective and, and why we're here today is to sort of try to begin answering some of those questions, to try to resolve a little bit of that uncertainty because, you know, uh, there are, it, it's hard enough to, to get by without feeling like you don't even have answers to the fundamental questions that affect you. Um, so we have a couple more minutes in this section. I just want to open it up. If there are other people in the room who have stories about their own health, questions about their health, and they wanted to share, yeah, Miss Irene, you can either, yeah, you can come up here. Maybe I think this mic is this live. Is my voice louder? <laughs> Great. So Miss Irene, if you wanted to use the mic, you can do that, or you can seem loud and proud. I think everybody can hear me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, by all means. Can hear you, Miss Irene. I have asthma, and I'm in the back and forth in the hospital because of asthma. <coughs> I don't leave home without it. <coughs> Traveling back in my goodness. My grandson, just born. He's a year and a half. He has asthma. And they're running back and forth every night. My grandson, my grand, my grandson. That, well, that's my great grandson to be. My grandson is getting a call every night. I, every other night, maybe every week. I gotta go to the hospital. He runs out the other hospital. Goes to the hospital. Maybe may stay in there a few days. Asthma. My other grandson, he has asthma. He's 18. But he's had asthma ever since he was a baby. And they live right down in 22nd and Fitzroy. You know, and it, the refinery, <coughs> the smoke, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's not just something right there, it travels. You know, and there's a lot of people that have asthma. And I'm wondering about the asthma. It needs to stop. Somebody needs to find something to stop them and find out what's in there that's giving everybody this cancer or this asthma and whatever else it causes. You know, it gets red, um, and it, the more it gets um, infected, the, the hotter it gets, and the more mucus it produces. So this is, you see, Inflammation, which leads to twitchiness, which means your airway easily constricts to triggers and then increased mucus production. So this is really what you're seeing that, that really is happening with asthma. You go from a real nice open one and then a pretty close one. The way we tell parents to think about it is to take a deep breath, breathe out, and then take a deep breath and breathe that same breath out through a straw and see how much harder it is to get that breath out. And that's what children with <coughs> asthma actually experience. Um, so environmental factors clearly play an uh, important role in indoor air quality is very important because we spend most of our time indoors. Um, 
we know that there are genetic factors. So I heard someone saying my mama had asthma and all these different asthma. So there are genetic factors that may predispose, that means give you a tendency to develop asthma, but actually the expression of those genetic um, patterns is influenced by the environmental exposures. I'll just go through. that's just a quick, um, and so we get airway inflammation, and we get increased uh, mucus in the lining of the airway. Uh, when I see children uh, with symptoms, that's just the tip of the iceberg. What's really going on underneath is the inflammation leading to the twitchiness, leading to basically obstructive flow. So we want to prevent those symptoms because, and the way we present those symptoms is starting at the, the bottom, at airway inflammation. One of the ways we do that, so obviously we do medications, but today we're going to talk about the environment. So we're going to focus on what we do for the environment. Um, so asthma triggers anything that causes irritation uh, or inflammation in the lungs, at least the symptoms. Um, and if you look at this house, there are very many ways where you can be exposed just in a normal house. Um, even the outdoor air pollutants get in. Uh, but in, in addition, you have mold and bacteria, you have chemical fum, uh, fumes, you have animal hair dander, you have smoke, uh, if you have a wood burning stove or a gas fireplace, there's a little bit of emission from that as well. I want to talk a little bit more about that. So again, most of us spend uh, most of our times indoors and they are the most likely uh, triggers to induce asthma attacks and also most likely to produce year-round symptoms and the most difficult to control. I want to talk about why. Well, the reason why is because it's everywhere. Um, these are the common triggers, dust mite, we all know everybody has dust mite, cockroach mice, pets, moles, environmental tobacco smoke, and volatile organic compounds, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, when we think about um, where a child spends most of their time, or a person spends most of their time, um, when they're not at school or not at work, it's going to be in their bedroom. <clears throat> so we really focus on the bedroom, it's the most important source of all the triggers, but especially dust. And where do you find it? You find it in carpets, mattresses, pillow covers, I'm sorry, pillows, upholstered furniture, and soft toys. And so um, on the right side, we have the exposure. On the left side, we have what you can do. Um, there's some really simple things you can do. Uh, get mattress and pillow covers. Washing your bed clothes in hot water. So every time you change your sheet, make sure you have the hottest linen for those who are sensitive to dust. Removing carpet, especially in the child's bedroom or in the person with asthma bedroom. Um, stuff toys in bedrooms, minimize that, and if you're going to have them, you either wash them weekly or you put them in the freezer. And nobody likes frozen stuff. Animals. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, vacuuming carpets uh, while child is outside the room. Um, so cockroaches is the other really common um, trigger, and any part of the cockroach dead or alive is uh, a, an allergen, so it can cause symptoms. The more you're exposed to it, the more likely you have severe sy symptoms, and they usually like warm, humid areas, especially with exposed food, such as the kitchen. So what can you do? Uh, poison baits, um, work acid, although <laughs> Uh, I have to tell you, 20 years ago when we started classes and we mentioned boric acid, every, all the parents in the classes laughed at us because they said, oh, the roaches eat boric acid, they love it. But um, so they didn't feel like it was effective and one of the reasons we kind of turned to some of the poison based in chocolate containers is because of the feedback from the parents. Um, food in garbage bags, always keeping those sealed. And, you know, those are simple things that you don't always think is going to make a difference, but it really does. Um, at the end of the night, if you can just put it outside of your house or your apartment, <clears throat> it will help <clears throat> reduce um, cockroach and, and mice even. Uh, washing the baseboards in hot water weekly, what that does is that just removes the, the allergens from the cockroaches. So if they pee, they have saliva along the way, you're just removing all of that. Uh, reducing humidity and wrapping pipe with insulation. Uh, mice we're learning more and more about. Uh, originally, uh, it was thought that cockroaches were the most common indoor air trigger, but we're finding that mice is becoming more of a problem. Um, they're very prevalent in not only in homes, but also in schools. Um, in some studies, the mouse antigen is found more in schools than they are in homes. Um, and the, the kids who have asthma who attend these schools with high mouse um, allergen, they tend to miss more school. Um, so how do you prevent that? You seal every hole you can find, either with uh, some steel wool or caulking, vacuuming a lot. Um, 
we um, in our in our program we give uh, flu traps. We don't use pesticides, um, and we keep food in sealed containers. So, um, animal danders. So, how many people think there's a hypoallergenic dog out there, or kids with that? There is none. Okay. <laughs> there is none. If it has any warm blood, if it has any kind of warm blood, it can produce allergen. Cats are the most common um, pet allergen, and really because they have very sticky dander, uh, it sticks to everything, and it can and it can actually remain in the environment six months after removing the cat from the environment. Um, it also travels on clothes. Um, my my husband has asthma, and he's really allergic to cats. Um, he can tell within a few minutes um, of talking to someone if they have a cat at home because he starts to feel. So even though you may not have that cat in your arm, you can still have that dander on your clothes. So um, obviously cats are pets and um, their emotions tied to that. So uh, you know, the, our, we would really love for um, uh, people who have um, children with asthma to take the cat and give it to a family member. Uh, if you can't do that, then we just ask you to keep it out of the bedroom and keep the door locked and not hold the cat. Uh, one of our this is the story for several years back. One of our uh, community health workers said, uh, yeah, she told me that you know the, child, the cat never goes in the child's bedroom, but I happened to be in the neighborhood. And I stopped by and I knocked on the door and the little boy opened the door with the cat in his oh, wow. <laughs> so, so we really don't want that to happen, even though we know that's hard. Uh, if you have carpet and upholstered furniture, if you can get rid of that, it's less likely to stick around. Uh, washing the cat twice weekly, which will probably get them away, uh, but also, <laughs> and clothes and vents to the room, and really running, you have the air uh, cleaner, uh, helps mostly with pet uh, dander more than anything else. Uh, molds, um, we, you know, are in humid areas, such as kitchen, bathrooms, refrigerators and filters, and don't forget to change your filters often. Um, that can be a good harbor source for our molds. Um, you know, we like to use humidifiers when people, when children have colds, or sometimes we just feel like it moistens the air, so it helps us breathe better, but that can also harbor mold spores. So if you're gonna do that, you have to clean it out regularly, or else you'll be just putting those mold spores in the air. Um, air conditions help keep the, the humidity down. Dehumidifiers are really great. Uh, and then if you know of any leaks, especially like roof leaks or bathroom leaks, you can eliminate those leaks or fix those leaks. And then cleaning the areas with uh, white vinegar or 10% chlorine bleach solution. But if you do the 10% chlorine bleach solution, you have to have lots of ventilation and your children shouldn't be around. Uh, so we don't really recommend that. So probably the most important, the most prevalent uh, trigger is environmental tobacco smoke. Um, it's a risk factor, it's, it's always bad. It's bad if you're pregnant with a child or with a, if you're bad after the child is born. It's bad if through the life of the child you smoke, it's bad if anyone in the house smokes. So it's a huge risk factor for developing asthma. So remember we talked about earlier about having a genetic tendency and then environment causes you to express some of that. Well, tobacco smoke will help you express all of your asthma. Um, it increases hospitalization and emergency room visits for children who have asthma, and the more exposure they have, the more likely they are to have attacks. Um, and even exposure to your baby as a, um, in utero uh, while you're pregnant can actually put them at risk for lung disease. Um, so obviously keeping um, home smoke free, keeping the car smoke free, some people remember the home and not the car, but both should be smoke free. And if you have um, a smoking, um, addiction, then it's really important to uh, get help. We all know that that's a, the hardest thing to do is to quit smoking. Any other kind of drug or any kind of thing, uh, quitting smoking is the hardest uh, to do. So there's lots of help out there. Um, and then if you have a child or a person in your family who has asthma and you haven't yet been able to stop smoking, you should smoke outside, wear a smoking jacket or a smoking shirt that you take off immediately because third hand smoke, which is smoke that's just sitting around, uh, is also a can produce uh, asthma attacks. So the last um, trigger I want to talk about, which is not known uh, maybe to a lot of us, is the volatile organic compounds. 
Um, so VOCs, as we call them, are molecules that easily vaporize at a room temperature, and they can come from paints, woods, fabrics, cleaning agents, fresheners, cosmetics. If you have cigarette smokes, it increase uh, some of those emissions. And some of the examples we have up there are, you know, they sound bad because they are bad. Because most of these can, some of these can cause cancer. education reform, you get three minutes, and I realize that three minutes goes really fast. Um, and I was just talking to Cindy Bass, and she seems to want to tell us that zoning isn't the big issue. She can't really do anything with zoning, that we need to go to the governor, and she's helping us go to the governor and talk to a bunch of other people. You know, I, that concerns me, because if we have the wrong notion that zoning isn't the issue, then I think it's our our uh, elected officials' responsibility to inform us what is the best route if they really do care about us as constituents and even their constituents that aren't here right now. I was a, um, I'm a health and physical education teacher for the school district of Philadelphia and I've lived in this neighborhood since I started with the district 23 years ago. And, uh, you know, I'm a car, I'm a bike commuter because I rejected that whole car notion when I lived in the suburbs where I grew up in Paoli and little mining community, limestone quarrying actually. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is that rejecting the car culture is part of what this is about. We want to be able to have clean transportation. SEPTA could be moving to 100% renewables right now and there's absolutely no debate. If you read Cindy Bass' statement, she says that there seems to be some data missing about the dangers of this plant. And I, I think the data has been out since Exxon knew the data like 40 years ago. And I think we ought to be suing Exxon now. Absolutely. And city council people that are with us, which yes. are helping us to yes. Exxon. Yes. Otherwise, their hands are dirty yes. when it comes to like approving or stepping aside and letting other people take over a site that we know is toxic. Now, why do students, my students, my, my students now from grads, because grads was turned into a charter school, are probably parents, I've seen a couple of them as I pass through every day to Edison. Uh, why do we have so much asthma here? Why is it like one out of every three students or children in Nice town has asthma instead of one out of four, like four is better. Well, you look above, what do you got? You got train rails spewing particulate matter. You've got Route 1 overhead. Like, who thought that was a good idea? Particulate matter sinks, right? So it's floating over this whole area every day, day and night. Particulate matter led from Route 1. And yet, 200 years ago, only 200 years ago, this was farmland. And 200 years ago, we had farms and we were, you know, but we hadn't started to go down into the earth and pull up this fossil fuel. And once we started doing that and getting ourselves connected and addicted to cars and fast and easy transportation and plastic, I mean, let's not forget plastic is the oil industry. I mean, my students, when they see me come into school on my bike, they think I'm weird. I'm like, but when I look at them and I say, yeah, but that's what car companies want you to think, then they start to get it. And I think that anybody at this point in the world today who can, who can look at a short-term gain of a 20-year natural gas refinery plant to save SEPTA money, first of all, SEPTA is under-subsidized because the oil industry is subsidizing this country, not public transportation. So the fact that SEPTA has to save money by using natural gas today is kind of a crooked deal when we know, in fact, there's plenty of money. It's just about, it's like the school district. There's plenty of money. It's not the teachers that are sucking the money. It's where they're giving that money. That's they're right. To consult. That's right. They're giving it to war. Right. 59% you know, of the budget in the U.S. goes to the military. Yep. And we don't have money for public schools, public right. transportation. Why are we so offended by that word public anymore? Because the capitalists, if I can use the big C, corporate interests, if I use the small C and the small I, want us to hate the government. Because remember, the government is the people, of the people, by the people. And as soon as we start separating people from their notion of what's public, then we're lost. And corporate interests win. And we know they want in Citizens United, and it's a slippery slope from there. of health disparity that we have. 
So we have health disparities in asthma. We have in Philadelphia a lot of asthma. You've, you've heard about that by the zip code. Some, some up to 40%. Very, very high asthma in some zip codes. We also have more cancer than uh, places in Pennsylvania and, and across the country. And so those are the outcome measures that I think um, answer the question, do we have enough regulation? I think the answer is no. We started um, in southwest Philadelphia looking at the Eastwick neighborhood. You'll see here in the, in the light color is uh, Eastwick. And it is bounded by a number of key exposures. The Clearview landfill was actually the reason we were asked to become part of uh, looking at this cumulative approach. And um, uh, the landfill doesn't have a lot of uh, airborne exposure, but uh, other kinds of exposures. But you'll see the refineries, uh, the Philadelphia International Airport, and really tremendous proximity to traffic. Now, one of the things that we all take for granted being in a city is, is the traffic. You live in a city, you have traffic. Everybody has traffic. But it is very meaningful to our health. The discharges from cars and trucks and uh, in some neighborhoods that are immediately adjacent to very large concentrations of these um, air pollutants, it's very meaningful to both asthma and cancer. And I would, I would urge us not to lose sight of that because it's, it is something that we can work on from a policy and legislative perspective. Then we thought about the prevailing winds. And we said, you know, Eastwick is not actually the worst case scenario for the parts of the city of Philadelphia. The prevailing winds go this way. And so what's over there? South Philadelphia. Not southwest Philadelphia, but south Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, refineries, southwest Philadelphia. Um, the wind goes in that, uh, that direction. Not every day, but prevailing winds. And so I'm, uh, this is not quite as nice a, a map, but I'm, I'm I uh, wanted to show you here, if this is southwest Philadelphia, this is south Philadelphia. And you see the oil refineries and the airport, but you also see 95 yeah. and 76, two of the largest high traffic um, roads in our region um, going through. Um, uh, and so not only do we have the airport, the refineries, and the traffic, but we also have um, TRI sources. Now, this is the toxic release inventory, and they are the, the point sources, the individual industrial sources that liberate um, air pollutants. And these are, in general, um, uh, sources that need permits. So they are they're all permitted. <coughs> and um, they're um, uh, considered part of this toxic release inventory. And they have to um, uh, tell the, the uh, EPA what their releases are. When we look for 2012 at, um, uh, for South Philadelphia specifically, we find that Philadelphia Energy Solutions is the largest on-site release in terms of pounds. Now, all of the pounds of these chemicals aren't all carcinogens, so um, let's break that down a little bit. Um, only 11% of the total amount of releases um, from 2012 were carcinogens. But some of them were really impressive ones. Um, benzene, 83%. Benzene is a known uh, uh, car carcinogen. Um, um, I'll show you in a minute uh, how it's classified. But the air toxics that cause cancer are coming from a number of sources. Um, we mentioned uh, already the on-road, the airport, the refinery, and when Philadelphia Air Management looks at, regardless of what the source is, when they look at the air altogether, 18 of the air toxics exceed the one in a million cancer risk threshold. Now, we'd like to not have anything um, in, be, uh, contribute to our risk uh, more than one in a million. That is the ideal. We would really you know, prefer that. But, um, 18 chemicals currently um, are doing more than that. The, the top five on their list are formaldehyde, benzene, acid aldehyde, 1,3-beta-diene, and carbon tetrachloride. And let me just show you what, um, how they, they, uh, they rate. The International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is the um, international agency that kind of everybody relies on to do the best scientific analysis of what's the what does the data show? What does the science show? Do we do we trust? Is it is something um, carcinogen to people? 
carcinogenic to people? Is it just carcinogenic in animals? Is it, do we have enough data to really know? Um, basically, when they say um, one, one are those items that are definitely carcinogenic to people. These other ones, two, they're sort of possibly or probably carcinogenic to people, but we don't really have all the data yet. So these are the ones, these are the top five toxics in Philadelphia. Benzene, 1,3-butadiene, and formaldehyde all have that IR classification of one, and they are among the top five. Okay. So um, I think that's a problem. I think that that is, is um, uh, you know, a, a, an explanation for the um, higher cancer rates that we see in, in uh, Philadelphia. And here they are. So the blue bars are the um, U U.S. age-adjusted cancer rates. And these are for 100,000 people. The yellow is what we see in Pennsylvania. And the red is what we see in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, um, you actually have to be part of a study to gain access to zip code information on cancer. Um, so I, I do not have that for this particular um, uh, region of Philadelphia. So we're just looking at Philadelphia overall. And you can see that for um, uterine, colorectal cancer, and also lung cancer, um, Philadelphia is higher than both the US and the um, uh, Pennsylvania rates. And for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, we are <coughs> higher than the US rates, but not higher than um, Pennsylvania at large. Um, I would point out that at least three of these of the four cancers are clearly associated with environmental exposures. Mm -hmm. um, uterine maybe, we just don't have the science uh, that tells us that just yet. So the EPA um, puts together this um, cumulative cancer risk model. It's called the National Air Toxics Assessment. And in order to put together this model, they use the air monitors that they require the states and the cities to, um, to have an operation. And in Philadelphia, we, Philadelphia Air Management does this, um, does the monitoring for, um, uh, you know, for, for the EPA um, to be in compliance with the Clean Air Act. And so um, this data is from 2011. And um, it, what it shows here, if you can see the color, that um, the cancer risk um, and respiratory hazard index is between 50 and 75 um, for the South Philadelphia region. What you can also see is that there is only one um, air toxics monitor that this data comes from. So where's the next closest one? If the prevailing winds go this way, it's right up there. And wouldn't you know it, it's in a higher risk zone. So I am not an air, um, uh, uh, air uh, evaluation sort of uh, a scientist specialist, uh, but you'll hear from one soon. Um, uh, but I will, it strikes me as strange that this one is all they're you know, basing the data on. I'd really love to see some other ones here to really see what um, all is going on because I think that this may be represent an underestimate of, of the air toxics in the region. But just to tell you where other possibilities are, these are the air monitors in South and Southwest Philadelphia. Um, the PHA monitor um, is currently in place, but it's not yet ready to give good data. They're still working on it in terms of calibrating it and, and getting it up and running. And it will it will have some air toxic um, uh, data when when it's when it's ready. But it's um, it's been taking quite a while before they um, feel that it's it's ready. Based on the monitors that we do have over years, it appears that annual benzene concentrations are going down. But again, um, unclear whether or not the monitoring is adequate, whether or not there's um, enough information. Uh, to, to make those uh, those those um, conclusions. So, just in summary, um, cancer rates in Philadelphia for cancers impacted by the environment um, are higher than U.S. rates, and some higher than Pennsylvania uh, rates as well. 18 air toxics in Philadelphia exceed the one in a million cancer risk, and air toxics come from all sources: cars, trucks, the airport, refineries, industry. A lot of sources all coming together uh, to impact people. And so therefore, working on all strategies to reduce all emissions 
um, is, is a good plan. And some specific strategies that might be considered would be to incentivize clean diesel. So for instance, we could say, uh, if you're going to come into Philadelphia with a uh, diesel-powered vehicle um, that, that was um, uh, built before 2007 when, they, when the uh, new laws changed, maybe the toll has to, maybe the toll should be three times as much because that, that, uh, the impact on our air and the rest of us is so great. Just an example. Um, policy people probably have better ideas than that, but that's uh, the kind of thing I'm, I'm uh, suggesting. Incent incentivizing airport efficiency and reduction of I idling. You know, the, the, if you've ever flown out of Philadelphia Airport, you know you sit there idling for a really long time before that t that plane takes off quite often. That is a, a lot of uh, fuel that is, um, is uh, wasted. There are a lot of other emissions too. That's just one example that comes from the airport. Eliminate vehicle idling. You know, um, change our traffic patterns. We've been trying to work with the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission to try to think about some of that, to try to um, reduce the amount of idling and waiting and, and that kind of thing um, we have around the city. Enhance emission restrictions from all point sources that require permitting. Um, there, you know, I think that a more cumulative impacts approach should be taken to um, permitting uh, by DEP and other agencies of these uh, point sources. Eliminate the use of dirty fuel. There are still some institutions of higher learning in this city that actually use dirty fuel. They use um, uh, fuel number six. Now, um, there is a regulation that allows them to do that until some, some point in the future. You know, I think good citizens um, in, the, in the city should actually themselves um, uh, curtail the use of that dirty fuel because the people who meet different issues that concern me. I'm finding so many different mentality today. It seems hard. It seems it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. So so I'm ready. I'm ready for this challenge. And I was built. I was built for this. I think that I think we, that all, have we all have a purpose in life, life. and mine and mine is going to take on a task that, that most that most are back away back from, away from. That impossible, that impossible. So people, people say it's impossible. impossible. I see possibilities. I don't see anything, I don't see anything as impossible. being impossible. Mentality. Mentality. There are different, there are different mentalities, mentalities, but just like just there's like different, different ways to teach people how to read, there's different ways.